Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this summer's book buzz. My name is Betty McDowell. I'm one of the adult services librarians here at the library, and I order the adult nonfiction, and I'm joined by Charmaine Burleson, our cataloging and technical services librarian. She's going to be covering adult fiction. And Meg Miller, also an adult services librarian, she will be covering our adult graphic novels. Just a reminder that our summer reading challenge is going on. You just need to read eight books this summer, and the form is due on July 31st, so there's still a couple of days to get that in. And if you need help locating your next read, please fill out the Your Next Reads form or the Book Bundles form on our website. You can get personalized recommendations, or if you want a surprise, fill out the Book Bundles form, and we'll pick out a few books for you based on your preferences. And with that, I'll hand it over to Shermaine, who's going to be covering adult fiction. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Book Buzz. This is the Book Buzz for July 2021, presented by Flickerville Public Library. And I am the Cataloging Tech Services Librarian for Flickerville Public Library. So let's get started. Madam is this gothic novel that is about um, a woman who lives in Scotland and she becomes kind of like this school master mom type woman and there's a lot of privilege a lot of prestige going on such an honor to be there but it doesn't take long for her to suspect that there's something else going on kind of like and so her predecessor was a woman who just kind of like disappears and nobody knows like where she went or anything like that and it's just like okay um so nobody really talks about it but all these women are being prepared to be like these upstanding echelons in society so they're preparing them to be like mothers and wives and these great society women and she wants to do more than that so she's a little frustrated about preparing the girls for the future per se but you know there's an underlying feminist type of breaking the mold and not being just the same. But, you know, because it's a gothic, there's all kinds of twists and turns to that. First Day of Spring. This is a psychological thriller, but it's really crazy because um, the heroine-ish in the story, like when she's eight years old, she kills this boy. And everybody is scared of her and she's just like enjoying it because it feels so good. It felt so good to her. But um, like the rules just don't feel like they apply to her and everything at home is kind of weird and, it, and things are going on that are not like to her liking. So she feels powerful in this moment when she kills this kid. But like 20 years later, she's trying to bring up a daughter of her own and she's like a single mother. And all she wants is to forget her childhood and just like move on. But somebody knows um, like more secrets about her and what she did. And basically, um, you feel sorry for her and then you don't and then you kind of do and so you go on this roller coaster of emotions of like how do you feel sorry for a sociopath basically who has a child of their own so this is about um that but also about you know there's like these people who are judging her by her past and what she's done and you know can people change imposter syndrome imposter syndrome is uh, a book about a russian intelligence agent not exactly spy uh, but sort of who um gets placed into like silicon valley as a woman and she's like the coo of this company it's one of the most famous technology companies. And what she does is she kind of goes into companies and like dismantles them or implodes them within for Russia and for their benefit. And after a while, um, she meets this woman 
um, named Alice, who's like Chinese American, and they are so similar and opposite. So there's something that draws them to each other, but they're also kind of competition. And so um, Alice Liu was a Chinese American woman whose um, parents are like so glad she's at this company and all these different things, but she's not where she wants to be in the company. And like, she's trying to figure out how to break the molds and how to become a rise up in the ranks type thing. So she's trying to do that. And then um, there's like all this suspicion, like she starts to feel like something is wrong because like certain things about like the company are not like adding up and the privacy settings are becoming weird. And there's all these things that are kind of like doing not what she maybe thought that they should do. So um, what happens is, is the closer that Alice gets to who she thinks is the woman named Julia, she's thinking about her own world. She's in like about women breaking the mold into Silicon Valley in the tech world. And you know how you can do that. So there's kind of like this cat and mouse game between the two of them because you know, neither one knows that the other, well, they kind of do. It kind of, that's why it's a cat and mouse, but they don't really suspect, but they know that somebody is trying to, um, dismantle all these things that are going on and, and basically trying to do things in this company that are not right. And so each of them is trying to find out who's the other person trying to catch the other person, basically type thing. And so it's about like basically Silicon Valley and all the things that happen. And um, it basically it examines like women in tech and what it means as the American dream as a woman to be in these companies and do these um, certain things and how you can achieve your goals, believe in yourself um, when there's not the support. Revival season is about this black evangelical family that like travels around and the dad is a Baptist preacher and the daughter of this most famous Southern preacher, um, she discovers there's some shocking secrets about her father. And it puts her at odds with her faith and her family. And she's at war with like all these things that are awakening in her and all these discoveries of finding out that the way that their life has been set up and the way things have been going, um, that's not how real life works for everybody. Um, so every summer, um, her and her family pack up and they like go through these small Southern towns and they have like these revivals. And there's like tents and all kinds of people and, you know, trying to save people and, and, uh, you know, getting money, um, to travel and people, you know, giving offerings and all these types of things. And so this time in, uh, the daughter's, um, 15th year, um, she's 15. She, is just discovering that things are just not going the way everything is planned. And after one of the services, um, they basically get tested and everything that all of their beliefs and hopes and dreams, like get basically their faith gets tested. And there's like within a year, um, Miriam is her name. She decides um, whether her family and this newfound power that she has, because it turns out um, if, you know, all these things that she believed, well, it turns out that she's a healer that she thought her father was. So how do you reconcile those types of things? Because there's all this patriarchy and all these things as far as faith is concerned that 
she doesn't understand if she has this, why it's bad, or if it's good, just the crisis of conscience about all these things. So it celebrates feminism and faith. And it's a coming of age story about like a complicated family and what seems to be like how you live among the faithful when your faith is different from people around you or your level of faith is different, all those types of things. So that's what it's about. Bacchanal is um, the debut novel by this author. And so like, this is about kind of like a haunted carnival. So basically this has like, um, demons and voodoo practicing and all kinds of things. And so um, this woman who is very, very powerful um, and she like has this gift and she can communicate with animals and all these types of things. And so she joins a circus and she becomes an asset because she can make the animals, of course, do tricks and do things. But there's an evil like force that is following sort of like this caravan and these people and like this ancient demon has been let loose and like she kind of is the one who can help stop this evil um but she is trying to save her friends and just like find out like not only who she is but like if her powers come from an actual good place or not and she just has to keep herself in check so that she's not enveloped or surrounded by evil. So um, this is set in the Depression era South and it is a traveling carnival and that's what this is about. The Low Country Bride is about a woman who um, grew up in South Carolina and she is um, an assistant to a renowned New York City bridal company or brand rather. And so she has to move home with her dad um, because he, you know, kind of had like a, a health scare and she wanted to be sure she could take care of him because her mom died. Now, um, trigger warning, this is also about a church shooting and about a single dad who's trying to take care of his daughter and also reconcile the fact that his wife was uh, murdered in this mass shooting at the church. And the church is having services now. And it's hard for him because his daughter wants to connect with the community again and be in church. But he has kind of like lost his faith. But it's about more than just like religion and faith and family. But it's about love and you know, he's starting to have feelings for this woman, but he doesn't feel like there's any future um, because she's going back to New York City. She didn't come to stay, but she's trying to help him save his mother's bridal shop business that he took over when his mother died. So his mother and his wife did um, die very close together, but they meet each other and it's just like instantly all these things happening. And so um, how do you let go? And how do you love people? Um, the heroine Maya, she has like this health crisis going on. So there's all these things that are going on and all these reasons why they shouldn't be together. And it just keeps pushing and pushing and pushing. Um, but all of these are elements for the Low Country Bride. And Maya is a wedding dress designer, of course, as I said. So um, she is trying to get a position with this company she's apprenticing and somebody else is like trying to buy for the same position. So all this is going on. So if you like those type of rom-com type things, um, this is a book. Um, so One Last Stop by Casey McQuestion. This book is, it's kind of like time traveling and magical realism, um, but it's also, um, a love story and so these two women meet on a subway and it's just like uh the subway breaks down and there's all these things happening and so like they get to spend time together but what happens is one of them is a time traveler from the 70s 
and they're stuck in like this groundhog type loop. Um, it's, <laughs> I shouldn't say it's really hard to explain, but that's just like the simplest summary of like kind of what's happening. And so basically August is trying to do everything she can to save um, Jane because she wants them to be in the same timeline because she's figuring that this is who she wants to be with. But how do you do that when one of you is from 1970? Um, and so this is like this magical book about like August basically coming into her own, like coming of age, but there's the element, like I said, of Jane being from the 1970s and stuck in kind of like this like time traveling loop and how they can make that work. So are they going to make it work? Are they going to be together, fall in love? Now, The Hive is an interesting book because this is a story of survival and secrets. And so there are these three sisters who are fourth generation pest control, um, like business inheritors. And so the they want to be known for more than just the pest control family or the pest control girls. And they're trying to do all of these things to prove that they can run the business or, you know, that they can break away from the business. Should that be the case as well? Or do both like live their life, do all these things. And like their father is very, I shouldn't say very, but he's sort of misogynistic. There's a lot of patriarchy going on and there's all these secrets that just like blow up. And the mother is having this long term affair and the dad is like, <laughs> he doesn't think the daughters could take over the business anyway. So he's just trying to figure out what he can do to keep the legacy. But he hasn't even considered that they want to take over the business or that they want to do things. And then the sisters are fighting with each other. So there's all these things that are happening, but still at the same time, they still feel like the pest control business is a part of their lives. So this is about um, like the values that you share with family or have with family and how you deal with them and how you deal with all the emotions like regret and sadness and anger and all those things um, and how they strengthen the love you have for each other. So this is what this is about. Um, Real is a new series from Kennedy Ryan. She has written a series called The Kingmakers um, that is absolutely fabulous. Um, and we have the series and you should check it out. But this is about uh, like a Harlem Renaissance type um, movie that is being made and um, like Hollywood glamor and forbidden love, you know, the cliche of director and talent. Um, but um, the heroine basically goes from backstage Broadway to like center stage in Hollywood. And she's like an unknown, but everybody wants to her. Everybody wants to be her. And so she's being cast in this like Harlem Renaissance biopic. And like everything is like aligning. It's like like her time but is this a once in a lifetime role and is this uh attraction that she feels for the director and the love that they have is it like fleeting and fake and that's what she wants to find out but it's about like the um hollywood glam and the just like wild artistic type of environment and so that's what this is about. Daniel Hurst. So this is another like thriller, mystery, sort of um, more. Than, it's not really horror. But so this book is about um, this woman named Adele. And what's happening is, is that all of her exes are being killed off one by one in the order that she dated them. And I know some people may have like a dark sense of humor being like, oh, my exes are gone. Who cares? But 
there's something about it that just doesn't seem right. So she found her soulmate in this guy named Tom. And she's like, this is it. It's the last of the exes. And they're engaged to be married and they're looking for all this happiness. But at first, it seems like the deaths are accidental. But soon, like this pattern starts to emerge. And then all of a sudden, it's just like they're being killed one by one by one in the order that she dated them, like I said. And it's just like she's trying to figure out who's doing this because she thinks Tom may be next. And she's trying to prevent that from happening. So that's what the boyfriend is about. Survive the night. Um, I am a big fan of Riley Sanger. He is absolutely awesome. Um, he writes all of these novels that um, it kind of reminds me of like a an Arl Stein type, but for adults. <laughs> so um, I hope he doesn't hear that. It hates that. But that's um, what I think of him as. And um, so this novel that he has written, it is the 90s. And George W. Bush is president. George H. W. Bush, excuse me, is uh, president. And um, this is based on a college campus where Charlie Jones um, is a woman who is in the car with a man who might be a serial killer. So we get here because like... Um, Charlie met this guy on campus and like she's trying to figure him out and um there's like her best friend is basically murdered so there's a murder that happens and her best best friend is murdered and they kind of bond by like talking about this and um like there's all these things that they're talking about their life and what's going on and similarities and all these things. And so she's just trying to, you know, she wants to find out what happened with her friend. And the longer she sits in the seat with him, the longer she starts to think that he may have done it. And so she is just trying to figure out, is this guy Josh dangerous? Or is she just like filled with emotions and this is a figment of her imagination? Like this is not really happening. Um, so the one thing that like she really takes away from all of this is like, should she trust her instincts or not? And so she's like kind of trapped in the car with him and there's like, they're playing this kind of game. So you don't really know if she's just really like imagining all of these things or if it's really happening. And I don't mean like imagine like she's hallucinating, just like, is she making a bigger deal out of this? Or are both of them thinking like one or the other is like the culprit behind something? Like, uh, it's, it's kind of, <laughs> um, hard to explain, but, um, basically like she's trying to survive the night because she's trapped in the car with this person and trapped. Is she trapped? Is she not like, but she's trying to survive the night either way with this person who she's not really sure of and uh, trying to solve the mystery of not only her friend's murder, but the murder of three other people. That's what Survive the Night is about. So you can contact me at my email address, Tremaine B at FlugervilleTexas.gov. And if you have any book suggestions or anything that you would like to read or like to see, we have some more things coming out, but just let us know what you would like to see. And I hope you enjoyed the adult fiction that's coming out this year. Thank you so much, Jermaine. Now I'm going to be going over adult nonfiction. We're going to start off with some biographies and memoirs. First up is House of Sticks by Lee Tran. Lee Tran is just a toddler in 1993 when she and her family immigrate from a small town along the Mekong River in Vietnam to a two-bedroom railroad apartment in Queens. Lee's father, a former lieutenant in the South Vietnamese Army, spent nearly a decade as a prisoner of war, and the resettlement is made possible through a humanitarian program run by the U.S. government. Soon after they arrive, Lee joins her parents and three older brothers in New York. 
As they navigate this new landscape, Lee finds herself torn between two worlds. She knows she must honor her parents' Buddhist faith and contribute to the family livelihood, working long hours at home, and eventually as a manicurist alongside her mother at a nail salon in Brooklyn that her parents take over. But at school, Lee feels mounting pressure to blend in. With flashes of humor, this book weaves together her family's immigration experience with her own fraught and courageous coming of age. House of Sticks is a timely and powerful portrait of one girl's struggle to reckon with her heritage and forge her own path. Next up, we have The Ugly Cry by Danielle Henderson. If you fight that mother effort and you don't win, you're going to come home and fight me. Not the advice you'd normally expect from your grandmother, but Danielle Henderson would be the first to tell you her childhood was anything but conventional. Abandoned at 10 years old by a mother who chose her drug-addicted, abusive boyfriend, Danielle was raised by grandparents who thought their child-rearing days had ended in the 1960s. She grew up black, weird, and overwhelmingly uncool in a mostly white neighborhood in upstate New York, which created its own identity crises. Under the eye-rolling, foul-mouthed, loving tutelage of her uncompromising grandmother and the horror movies she obsessively watched, Danielle grew into a tall, awkward, sassy-loving teenager who wore black eyeliner as lipstick and was struggling with the aftermath of her mother's choices. But she also learned that she had the strength and smarts to save herself, her grandmother gifting her a faith in her own capabilities that the world would not have most black girls possess. With humor, wit, and deep insight, Danielle shares how she grew up and grew wise and the lessons she's carried from those days to these. Next, we have A Quantum Life, My Unlikely Journey from the Streets to the Stars by Hakeem Olisei. Navigating poverty, violence, and instability, a young James Plummer had two guiding stars, a genius IQ and a love of science. But a bookish nerd is a soft target, and James faced years of bullying and abuse. As he struggled to survive his childhood in some of the country's toughest urban neighborhoods in New Orleans, Houston, and L.A., and later in the equally poor backwoods of Mississippi, he adopted the persona of gangsta nerd, dealing weed and juke joints while winning state science fairs with computer programs that model Einstein's theory of relativity. Once admitted to the elite physics PhD program at Stanford University, James found himself pulled between the promise of a bright future and a dangerous crack cocaine habit he developed in college. With the encouragement of his mentor and the sole black professor in the physics department, James confronted his personal demons as well as the entrenched racism and classism of the scientific establishment. When he finally seized his dream of a life in astrophysics, he adopted a new name, Hakeem Mwata Olisei, to honor his African ancestors. Alternately heartbreaking and hopeful, A Quantum Life narrates one man's remarkable quest across an ever-expanding universe filled with entanglement and choice. Next, we have I Have Always Been Me, a memoir by Precious Brady Davis. Precious Brady Davis remembers the sense of being singular and grappling with otherness. Born into traumatic circumstances, Davis was brought up in the Omaha foster care system and the Pentecostal faith. As a biracial, gender nonconforming kid, she felt displaced. Yet she realized by coming into her identity that she had a purpose all along. And I have always been me, Brady Davis reflects on a childhood of neglect, instability, and abandonment. She reveals her determination to dream through it and shares her profound journey as a trans woman, now fully actualized, absolutely confident, and precious. She speaks to anyone who has ever tried to find their place in this world and imparts the wisdom that comes with surmounting odds and celebrating on the other side. And by Janie Trejo, we have Trejo, My Life of Crime, Redemption, in Hollywood. On screen, Danny Trejo is the actor, is a baddie, who has been killed at least a hundred times. Off screen, he's a hero beloved by recovery communities and obsessed fans alike. But the real Danny Trejo is much more complicated than the legend. Raised in an abusive home, Danny struggled with heroin addiction and stints in some of the country's most notorious state prisons, including San Quentin and Folsom, from an early age, before starring in such modern classics as Heat, From Dusk Till Dawn, and Machete. Now in this funny, painful, and suspenseful memoir, Danny takes us through the incredible ups and downs of his life. Trejo is a portrait of a magnificent life and an unforgettable and exceptional journey through tragedy, pain, and finally success that will transfix and inspire. And by Adam Stern, we have Committed Dispatches from a Psychiatrist in Training. Adam Stern was a student at a state medical school before being selected to train as a psychiatry resident at one of the most prestigious programs in the country. His new and initially intimidating classmates were high achievers from the Ivy League and other elite universities around the nation. Faculty raved about the group as though the residency program had won the lottery, nicknaming them the Golden Class, but would Stern ever prove that he belonged? 
In his memoir, Stern pulls back the curtain of the intense and emotionally challenging lessons he and his fellow doctors learned while studying the human condition and ultimately the value of connection. The narrative focuses on these residents, their growth as doctors, and the life choices they make as they try to survive their grueling four-year residency. Rich with drama, insight, and emotion, Stern shares engrossing stories of life on the psychiatric wards, as well as the group's experiences as they grapple with the imposter syndrome and learn about love and loss. Most importantly, as they study how to help distressed patients in search of a better life, they discover the meaning of failure and the preciousness of success. And by Sophia Benoit, we have, well, this is exhausting. Like so many women, Benoit spent her formative years struggling to do the right thing, to make others comfortable, to take minimal and calculated risks, to live up to society's expectations, only to realize that there was so little payoff to this tiresome balancing act. Now in Well, This is Exhausting, she shares her journey from aspiring good girl to proud feminist and addresses the constantly shifting goalposts of what exactly it means to be good in today's world including topics as varied as and laugh out loud funny as how to be the life of the party, even when you have crippling anxiety, navigating the disappointments of the dating world, and why no one should judge you for having an encyclopedic knowledge of reality TV stars. These essays are sure to move, motivate, and charm you. Next up, we have some science books. And first we have Fear of a Black Universe, An Outsider's Guide to the Future of Physics by Stefan Alexander. Years ago, cosmologist Stefan Alexander received life-changing advice. To discover real physics, he needed to stop memorizing and start taking risks. In Fear of a Black Universe, he shows that great physics requires us to think outside the mainstream, to improvise and rely on intuition. His approach leads him to three principles that shapes all theories of the universe. The principle of invariance, the quantum principle, and the principle of emergence. Alexander uses them to explore some of physics' greatest mysteries, from what happened before the Big Bang to how the universe makes consciousness possible. Drawing on his experience as a black physicist, he makes a powerful case for diversifying our scientific communities. Compelling and empowering fear of a black universe offers remarkable insight into the art of physics. Next up, we have The Brilliant Abyss by Helen Scales. A golden era of deep sea discovery is underway. Revolutionary studies in the deep are rewriting the very notion of life on earth and the rules of what is possible. In the progress, the abyss is being revealed as perhaps the most amazing part of our planet, with a topography even more varied and extreme than its earthbound counterpart. Teeming with unsuspected life, an extraordinary interconnected ecosystem deep below the waves has a huge effect on our daily lives, influencing climate and weather systems, with the potential for much more, good or bad, depending on how it is exploited. Currently, the fantastic creatures that live in the deep capture and trap vast quantities of carbon that would otherwise poison our atmosphere. And novel bacteria, as yet undiscovered, hold the promise of potent new medicines. Yet the deep also holds huge mineral riches lusted after by many nations and corporations. Mining them could ultimately devastate the planet, compounded by the deepening impacts of ubiquitous pollutants and rampant overfishing. Helen Scales bring to life, brings to life the majesty and mystery of an alien realm that nonetheless sustains us, while urgently making clear the price we pay if it is further disrupted. The Brilliant Abyss is at once a revelation and a clarion call to preserve this vast unseen world. Next we have The Ice Pick Surgeon by Sam Keen. Science is a force for good in the world, at least usually, but sometimes when obsession gets the better of scientists, they twist a noble pursuit into something sinister. The Ice Pick Surgeon masterfully guides the reader across 2,000 years of history, beginning with Cleopatra's dark deeds in ancient Egypt. The book reveals the origins of much of modern science in the transatlantic slave trade of the 1700s, as well as Thomas Edison's mercenary support of the electric chair and the warped logic of the spies who infiltrated the Manhattan Project. But the sins of science aren't all safely buried in the past. Many of them, Keen reminds us, still affect us today. We can draw direct lines from the medical abuses of Tuskegee and Nazi Germany to current vaccine hesitancy and connect ice pick lobotomies from the 1950s to the contemporary failings of mental health care. Keen even takes us into the future, when it events computers and genetic engineering could unleash whole new ways to do another wrong, do one another wrong. Unflinching and exhilarating to the last page, the ice pick surgeon fuses the drama of scientific discovery with the illicit thrill of a true crime tale. With his trademark wit and precision, Keen shows that, while science has done more good than harm in the world, rogue scientists do exist, and when we sacrifice morals for progress, we often end up with neither. And now we have some true crime, starting with the case of the murderous Dr. Cream, the hunt for a Victorian era serial killer by Dean Job. 
In the span of 15 years, Dr. Thomas Neal Cree murdered as many as 10 people in the United States, Britain, and Canada, a death toll with almost no precedent. Poison was his weapon of choice. Largely forgotten today, this villain was as brazen as the notorious Jack the Ripper. Structured around the doctor's London murder trial in 1892, when he was finally brought to justice, the case of the murderous Dr. Cream exposes the blind trust given to medical practitioners, as well as the flawed detection methods, bungled investigations, corrupt officials, and stifling morality of Victorian society that allowed Dr. Cream to prey on vulnerable and desperate women, many of whom had turned to him for medical help. For fans of Eric Larson's The Devil in the White City, All Things Sherlock Holmes, or the podcast My Favorite Murder, the case of the murderous Dr. Cream is an unforgettable true crime story by a master of the genre. And by Makita Brotman, we have couple found slain after a family murder. On February 21, 1992, 22-year-old Brian Bechtold walked into a police station in Port St. Joe, Florida, and confessed that he'd shot and killed his parents in their family home in Silver Spring, Maryland. He said he'd been possessed by the devil. He was eventually diagnosed with schizophrenia and ruled not criminally responsible for the murders on grounds of insanity. But after the trial, where did the criminally insane go? Broughton reveals Brian's inner life leading up to the murder, as well as his complicated afterlife in a maximum security psychiatric hospital, where he is neither in prison nor free. During his, one, his 27 years at the hospital, Brian has tried to escape and been shot by police and has witnessed three patient-on-patient -patient murders. He's experienced the drugging of patients beyond recognition, a sadistic system of rewards and punishments, and the short-lived reign of a crazed psychiatrist turned stalker. In the tradition of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, Couple Found Slain is an insider's account of life in the underworld of forensic psych wards in America, and the forgotten lives of those held there, often indefinitely. And now we have some history books, starting with Scott Ellsworth's The Groundbreaking, an American City in Its Search for Justice. More than 1,000 homes and businesses, restaurants and movie theaters, churches and doctor's offices, a hospital, a public library, a post office, looted, burned, and bombed from the air. Over the course of less than 24 hours in the spring of 1921, Tulsa's Black Wall Street was wiped off the map and erased from the history books. Official records were disappeared, researchers were threatened, and the worst single incident of racial violence in American history was kept hidden for more than 50 years, but there were some secrets that would not die. A riveting and essential new book, the groundbreaking not only tells the long-suppressed story of the notorious Tulsa Race Massacre, it also unearths the lost history of how the massacre was covered up and of the courageous individuals who fought to keep the story alive. Most importantly, it recounts the ongoing archaeological saga at, and the search for the unmarked graves of the victims of the massacre and of the fight to win restitution for the survivors and their families. Both a forgotten chronicle from the nation's past and a story ripped from today's headlines, the groundbreaking is a page-turning reflection of how we, as Americans, must wrestle with parts of our history that have been buried for too long. And by Danielle Dreilinger, we have The Secret History of Home Economics. The term home economics may conjure traumatic memories of lopsided hand pillows or sunken muffins, but common conception obscures the history of the revolutionary science of better living. The field exploded opportunities for women in the 20th century by reducing domestic work and providing jobs as professors, engineers, chemists, and business people. And it has something to teach us today. In a surprising, often fiercely feminist and always fascinating, the secret history of home economics, Danielle Dreilinger traces the field's history from black colleges to Eleanor Roosevelt to Okinawa, from a Betty Crocker brigade to DIY techies. These women, and they were mostly women, became chemists and marketers, studied nutrition, health, and exercise, tested parachutes, created astronaut food, and took bold steps in childhood development and education. This groundbreaking and engaging history restores a denigrated subject to its rightful importance as it reminds us that everyone should learn how to cook a meal, balance their account, and fight for a better world. And by Anne Hagedorn, we have Sleeper Agent, the atomic spy in America who got away. George Koval was born in Iowa. In 1932, his parents, uh, Russian Jews who had emigrated because of anti-Semitism, decided to return home to live out their socialist ideals. It was there that George was recruited by the Soviet Army as a spy and returned to the U.S. in 1940. A gifted science student, he eventually secured an assignment at a site where plutonium and uranium were produced to fuel the atom bomb. There, and later in a second top-secret location, he had full access to all facilities, and he passed highly sensitive information to Moscow. Kov was the only Soviet military spy with security clearances in the atomic bomb project. The ultimate sleeper agent, he was an all-American boy who had played baseball, 
loved Walt Whitman's poetry, and mingled freely with fellow Americans. After the war, he got away without a scratch. It is indisputable that his information landed in the right hands in Moscow. In 1949, Soviet scientists produced a bomb identical to America's years earlier than U.S. experts expected. A gripping, fast-paced, extensively researched story about one undetected spy who influenced history. And finally, we have The Failed Promise, Reconstruction, Frederick Douglass, and the Impeachment of Andrew Johnson by Robert S. Levin. When Andrew Johnson assumed the presidency after Abraham Lincoln's assassination, the country was on the precipice of radical change. Johnson, seemingly more progressive than Lincoln, looked like the ideal person to lead the country. He had already cast himself as a Moses for the black community, and African Americans were optimistic that he would pursue aggressive federal policies for black equality. Despite this early promise, Frederick Douglass, the country's most influential black leader, soon grew disillusioned with Johnson's policies and increasingly doubted the president was sincere in supporting black citizenship. In a dramatic and pivotal meeting between Johnson and a black delegation at the White House, the president and Douglass came to verbal blows over the course of Reconstruction. As he lectured across the country, Douglass continued to attack Johnson's policies while raising questions about the radical Republicans' hesitancy to grant African Americans the vote. Johnson, meanwhile, kept his eye on Douglas, eventually making a surprising effort to appoint him to a key position in his administration. Levine gripplingly portrays the conflicts that brought Douglas and the wider black community to reject Johnson and call for a guilty verdict in his impeachment trial. He brings fresh insight by turning to letters between Douglas and his sons, speeches by Douglas and other major black fig figures like Francis E.W. Harper, and articles and letters in the Christian Recorder, the most important African-American newspaper of the time. In counterpointing the lives and careers of Douglas and Johnson, Levine offers a distinctive vision of a lost promise and dire failure of the Reconstruction, the effects of which still reverberate today. And for self-help, we have Decoding Greatness by Ron Friedman. For generations, we've been taught there are two ways to succeed, either from talent or practice. In Decoding Greatness, award-winning social psychologist Ron Friedman illuminates a powerful third path one that has quietly launched icons in a wide range of fields from artists, writers, and chefs to athletes, inventors, and entrepreneurs, reverse engineering. Using eye-opening examples of top performers from Agatha Christie to Andy Warhol, Barack Obama to Serena Williams, and groundbreaking research on pattern recognition, skill acquisition, and creative genius, the author reveals the staggering power of reverse engineering and teaches you how to harness this vital skill for yourself. You'll learn how to take apart models you admire, pinpoint precisely what makes them work, and apply that knowledge to develop novel ideas, methods, and products that are uniquely your own. And next we have sports, starting with Kent Babs across the river, life, death, and football in an American city. On the west bank of the Mississippi lies the New Orleans neighborhood of Algiers. Short on hope but big on dreams, its most poor and marginalized residents find joy on Friday nights when the Cougars of Edna Carr High School take the field. For years, this football program has brought glory to Algiers winning three consecutive state championships and sending dozens of young men to college on football scholarships. In Across the River, award-winning sports journalist Kent Babb follows the Carr football team through its 2019 season as their coach, Bryce Brown, and his team, perhaps the scrappiest and most rebellious group in the program's history, vie to again succeed on and off the field and deal with the serious realities of young athletes in struggling neighborhoods. Gentrification, eviction, mental health, the drug trade, gun violence, it offers a rich and unflinching portrait of a coach, his players, and the West Bank, a community where it's difficult but not impossible to rise above the chaos, discover purpose, and find a way out. And next we have Till the End by CC Sabahia. Baseball has been CC's life since he was a kid in gritty baseball obsessed Vallejo, California. He was a star by the time he was a preteen and a professional athlete when he was still a teenager. Everything he knew about how to be a person, an adult, a husband, a father, a leader, he learned in rhythm with the baseball season, all while dealing with one of the sport's most turbulent eras, racism in a sport with diminishing black presence, the era of performance-enhancing drugs, and the increasing tension between high-value contracts and sports owners who moved players around like game pieces. But his biggest struggle was with his own body and mind. Buoyed his whole life by talent and a fiery competitive spirit, CC found himself dealing with the steady and eventually alarming breakdown of his own body and his growing addiction in a world that encouraged and enabled it. Till the End is a thrilling memoir of one of the most beloved players in the game, a veteran star of the sports marquee team during its latest championship era. It's also a book about baseball, 
about the ins and outs of its most important and technical position and its evolution in this volatile era. But woven within it is the moving universal story of resilience and mortality and discovering what matters. And last, we have Secrets of the Force, the complete, uncensored, unauthorized oral history of Star Wars by Edward Gross and Mark A. Altman. For the past four decades, no film saga has touched the world in the way Star Wars has, capturing the imaginations of filmgoers and filmmakers alike. Now, for the first time ever, Edward Gross and Mark A. Altman, the best-selling authors of The 50-Year Mission, are telling the entire story of this blockbuster franchise from the very beginning in a single, exhaustive volume. Featuring the commentaries of hundreds of actors and filmmakers involved with and impacted by Star Wars, as well as writers, commentators, critics, executives, authors, film historians, toy experts, and many more, Secrets of the Force will reveal all in Altman and Gross's critically acclaimed oral history format from the birth of the original film through the latest sequels and the new television series. And I've got a few bonus books that I want to highlight but didn't have time to get to today. We have Dirty Work, Essential Jobs, and the Hidden Toll of Inequality in America by Ail Press, Refugee High, Coming of Age in America by Ellie Fishman, and Gold, Oil, and Avocados, A Recent History of Latin America in 16 Commodities by Andy Robinson. Thank you so much for your time. If you have questions, you can email me at bettym at pflugervilletx.gov. That's B-E-T-T-E-M as in mom at pflugervilletx.gov. All right. I'm Meg Miller, an adult services librarian, and I order our adult graphic novel collection. I'm going to be trying to squeeze in 30 titles in the next 20 minutes, so let's get started with two titles from last month that weren't featured in the April Book Buzz but are worth a look. Let's Make Dumplings, a comic cookbook out June 22nd from 10 Speed Press, is an accessible and easy-to-follow comic book cookbook for bringing Asian dumplings into the home kitchen with recipes for savory and sweet, dumplings, dipping sauces, riffs, and more. From the authors of Let's Make Ramen, which is already in the library collection, Chef Hugh Amano and comics artist Sarah Bacan invite you to explore the big little world of Asian dumplings. Ideal for both newbies and seasoned cooks, this comic book cookbook takes a fun approach to a classic treat that is imbued with history across countless regions, from wontons to potstickers, Amano's expert guidance paired with Bacan's colorful and detailed artwork prove that intricate folding styles and flavorful fillings are achievable in the home kitchen. Let's Make Dumplings includes dumpling lore, a master folding guide that familiarizes readers with popular styles like the pleated crescent of a potsticker or the four-pointed star of a crab rangoon, and a series of cooking directions to choose from, such as steaming or pan frying. This book captures the deep level of connection that dumplings bring to any gathering and shows you how to recreate it in your own home. And from Icon Books, also on the 22nd, was Quarantine Comics, A Memoir of Life in Lockdown. An award-winning graphic memoir of lockdown life, Quarantine Comics is a funny, tender, heartfelt, and insightful look at isolation. Written and drawn every day during the 2020 lockdown and shared online with the hashtag Quarantine Comics, Rachel Smith's delightful comics helped people who were isolated all over the world feel connected. At times, laugh out loud funny, at others bittersweet, philosophical, or downright silly. This collection of 200 drawings tells the story of one woman overcoming loneliness and self-doubt with exquisite, wry humor and raw honesty. During a time when many feel anxious and apart from loved ones, Quarantine Comics offers relief in shared experiences. Next up is the titles we got this month. Cain and Abel... Uh, July 6th from Image Comics is comic book wise guys. Cain and Abel serve up a summer dump cake of genre busting mischief and mass mayhem in this oversized anthology of never before published strips. Slip in and out of subconsciousness with the astonishing shield bug. Surf the flesh wave with black fur in who fears the death roach. Journey into the sub basement of the gasoline tinged dust mites. Ride into the creep zone with nightmare and sleepy in the aptly named creep zone. And Love Me, Please, the story of Janis Joplin, July 13th from NBM Publishing, is a biography and comics of the amazing rock singer Janis Joplin with the highlights of her journey from childhood after the Second World War to her abrupt death in late 1970. It is one of the most fabulous musical adventures in America during the second half of the 20th century, yet it lasted only five years. How did a very young, messed up woman, a drug addict filled with doubt, become a planetary icon of rock music in a few years? Thanks to a worldwide movement of emancipation, which would consecrate 
for a long time the ideals and modes of alternative lifestyles from counterculture to the flower power generation, Janice, the ugly duckling, gave free reign to her impulses. Fed by the thirst for freedom of the beat generation and the desire for emancipation expressed by American youth in the early 1960s, Janis Joplin left, San Francisco, left for San Francisco, the epicenter of cultural innovation. There she abandoned herself to all impulses, overcoming without hesitation all the taboos of the time, bisexuality, alcohol, and drugs, doing so not only with delight, but with the taste for excess, which came naturally from her spontaneous character. Next, Seek You, A Journey Through American Loneliness, also July 13th. This is from Pantheon. From the acclaimed author of Imagine Wanting Only This, a timely and moving meditation on isolation and longing, both as individuals and as a society, and is one of Lit Hub's most anticipated books of 2021. There's a silent epidemic in America, loneliness. Shameful to talk about and often misunderstood, loneliness is everywhere, from the most major of metropolises to the smallest of towns. In Seek You, Kristen Radke's wide-ranging exploration of our inner lives and public selves, Radke digs into the ways in which we attempt to feel closer to one another and the distance that remains. Through the lens of gender and violence, technology and art, Radke ushers us through a history of loneliness and longing and shares what feels impossible to share. Ranging from the invention of the laugh track to the rise of Instagram, the bootstraps pulling cowboy to the brutal experiments of Harry Harlow. Radke investigates why we engage with each other and what we risk when we turn away. With her distinctive, emotionally charged drawings and deeply empathetic prose, Kristen Radke masterfully shines a light on some of our most vulnerable and sublime moments and asks how we might keep the spaces between us from splitting entirely. Also July 13th, Bubble from First Second. Based on the smash hit audio serial, Bubble is a hilarious high energy graphic novel with a satirical take on the gig economy. Built and maintained by corporate benevolence, the city of Fairhaven is a literal bubble of safety and order and amazing coffee in the midst of the brush, a harsh alien wilderness ruled by monstrous imps and rogue bands of humans. Humans like Morgan, who's brush born and bubble raised and fully capable of fending off an imp attack during her morning jog. She's got a great routine going. She has a chill day job. She recreationally kills the occasional imp. Then she takes that imp home for her roommate and BFF Annie to transform into drugs as a side hustle. But cracks appear in her tidy life when one of those imps nearly murders a delivery guy in her apartment accidentally transforming him into a brush-powered mutant in the process. And when Morgan's company launches Hunter, a gig economy app for imp extermination, she finds herself press-ganged into kicking her stabby side job up to the next level as she battles a parade of monsters and monstrously brush-turned citizens. From a living hipster beard to a book club hive mind. And the true lives of the fabulous Killjoys national anthem is coming July 20th from Dark Horse Books. Forget everything you already know about the fabulous Killjoys. Writers Gerard Way and Sean Simon, along with illustrator Leonardo Romero, colorist Jordi Belair, and letterer Nate Picos, team up to present an all-new modern-day Killjoy series as Way and Simon take it all the way back to the original story that inspired My Chemical Romance's concept album Danger Days and its dystopian comic book series in the true lives of the Fabulous Killjoys national anthem. The Fabulous Killjoys, once a group of teenage exterminators determined to save reality, have lost their way and their memories. After a period of mental confinement, former Killjoys leader Bria... Mike Milgram gets deprogrammed and hits the road to bring the gang back together for a final showdown against an even evil pharmaceutical corporation, their monstrous hitman and savage gang of rivals. One line from Oni press is from Eisner award nominee, Ray Fox, the third book in the ambitious, intricately constructed one soul series. As One Soul followed 18 people from birth until death, showcasing their common joys and pains, as well as their unique experiences, One Line follows 18 families through four centuries, showing how traditions, ethics, and prejudices are handed down from generation to generations. Some families will interact, some will join together, some will remain alone, some will persist, and some will die out. 
and the Yakuza's Guide to Babysitting, Volume 1, from Kaiten Books, also on July 20th. Who's your nanny? Kirishima Toru is the right-handed man of Saguragi crime family. For him, the job is a perfect excuse to let his violent instincts run wild, earning him the nickname the Demon of Sakuragi. It seems like nothing will stand in the way of his vicious nature, but then one day he receives an assignment like never before from the boss, babysitting his daughter. This is the heartwarming, or is it blood-curdling, story of a little girl and her Yakuza caretaker. Also another manga title, number five, volume one from Viz Media is a powerfully imagined vision of the future from Taiyo Matsumoto, creator of the Eisner Award winning Cats of the Louvre. In a world where most of the earth has become a harsh desert, the Rainbow Council of the Peace Corps has grown, has a growing crisis on its hands. Number five, one member of a team of super powered global security guardians and a top marksman has gone rogue. Now the other guardians have to hunt down number five and his mysterious companion. But why did number five turn against the council? And what will it mean for the future of the world? Bit of a manga trio here with Sheri My Destiny, also July 20th. This is from Love by Love from Tokyo Pop. My chocolate's so good, it'll make you gravel on your knees. Kaoru is brimming with confidence. After all, he opened a pe patisserie after studying in France and is the head chef of his own store. But there's one small problem. His customers are enamored with a local Japanese sweet shop and Shojiru, the attractive and reserved craftsman who makes the treats on offer. Convinced that this that stuffy old Japanese confections could never compete with his modern Western style creations, he decides the only way to forward is to prove to, to to Sojiru that his chocolates are the best. But when Sojiru accepts his gifts gracefully and even compliments him on his skills, Kaoru is intense feelings take a sudden turn in the opposite direction. Next up, also July 20th from Dark Horse Books is Everyone is Tulip. Centered around the aspiring actress Becca and her whirlwind rise to stardom, Everyone is Tulip is an original graphic novel that explores what it means to be a star in a generation that places more attention and value on YouTube clips and memes than it does Hollywood celebrities. Becca Harper lands an acting role she didn't think would go anywhere and suddenly finds herself flung into a 15 minutes of fame that sees her likeness not up in lights, but in memes, reaction videos, and even conspiracy theories. Donning the guise of Tulip for an experimental artsy video directed by an affluent jerk that she somehow ends up dating, Becca's dream seems to have come true when her persona becomes the talk of the internet. With a sudden army of fans, complications arise when Becca begins to question whether or not she has the right to consider herself a star. Created by indie comic all-stars Dave Baker and Nicole Gao, Everyone is Tulip is a deeply psychological exploration of the new frontier of modern media and the discomfort of internet fame. Bliss, at the end of July on the 27th, from Image, there's a drug called Bliss wiping away memories in Feral City, but a good-hearted young man with a deathly sick child makes a horrible deal. He will become the hidden man for the gods providing the drug and possibly lose everything in the process. A critically acclaimed examination of forgiveness and family that's rarely seen in comics. Now I've got some titles coming out next month, starting with... Rain Like Hammers on the 3rd from Image Comics. Eisner Award-winning writer and artist Brandon Graham presents a self-contained graphic novel of distant, far-future science fiction. To rescue Elle, a young woman who has unknowingly entered a competition for immortality, supercriminal Brick Block journeys to the palace world of Sky Cradle. He disguises himself by mind-transferring into the body of a genetically engineered butler and begins making plans to steal an aristocrat's Finger keys, meanwhile. Meanwhile, the walking cities on the desert world of Crown Majesty are being picked off by an unseen force. And here we have also on the third, first degree, a crime anthology from Humanoids. David F. Walker and David Aha are joined by 
an array of international talent for an anthology that puts the spotlight on crime noir. In this anthology, a collective of almost 30 authors from all over the globe propose a collection of short crime noir stories that celebrate the genre as well as boldly leading it into the future. And this is of my era, and I'm looking forward to this, also on August 3rd from Z2 Comics, Sublime, $5 at the door. Celebrate the sounds of SoCal's favorite sons with this official original graphic novel. After teenage pals Bud and Eric form a band in high school, it takes a fateful meeting with a new kid named Bradley to discover the blend of punk rock and reggae that would define an era. Xanadu meets Superbad in this heartfelt anthology of sublime legends brought to life by Ryan Cady and a cadre of the industry's most talented illustrators, featuring a brand new cover by sublime logo creator Opie Ortiz. Witcher fans will get The Witcher Volume 5 Fading Memories on August 10th from Dark Horse. As Geralt explores new career possibilities, he receives a request from the Mayoress of Towitz, a small town where children are being kidnapped by Foglets. Upon accepting the work, Geralt thrusts into the mysterious past of a mourning mother and her now abducted son. Caught between the townsfolk's recollections of ki the kidnapping and a slew of disturbing visions, he must face the approaching danger with his own intuition. And this beautiful book from Beehive Books, also on August 10th, is the English language edition of Natalie Ferlu and Tamia Badouin's stunning biography of Artemisia Gienteschi a trailblazing Italian Baroque painter originally published in French. This full color graphic novel recounts the remarkable story of a life whose story is told through the lens of her daughter as she questions her mother about their family history. The ensuing tale spans most of her life, beginning with her childhood in Rome, in her father's painting studio, to the sexual abuse she experienced at the hands of a tutor and the arduous trial that followed as well as the highlights of her prolific career in which she received commissions from clients as powerful as the Medici and the English royal family and became the first woman admitted to the prestigious Academy of Arts in Florence. And this is, do you hear what Eddie Gein done? Um, August 17th from Albatross Funny Books. One of the greats in the field of true crime literature, Harold Schechter, teams with five-time Eisner Award-winning graphic novelist Eric Powell to bring you the tale of one of the most notoriously deranged serial killers in American history, Ed Gein. Did you hear what Eddie Gein done is an in-depth exploration of the Gein family and what led to the creation of the necrophile who haunted the dreams of 1950s America and inspired such films as Psycho, the Ch Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and The Silence of the Lambs. Painstakingly researched and illustrated, Schechter and Powell's true crime graphic novel takes the Gein story out of the realms of exploitation and gives the reader a fact-based dramatization of these tragic, psychotic, and heartbreaking events. Because in this case, the truth needs no embellishment to be horrifying. And Crisis Zone, August 17th from Fantagraphics. In March 2020, as the planet began to enter lockdown, acclaimed cartoonist Simon Hanselman decided that what the world needed most was free, easily accessible entertainment, so he set out to make the greatest webcomic ever created. The result is also certain to be one of the most acclaimed and eagerly anticipated graphic novels of 2021. As the COVID-19 pandemic continued to escalate far beyond any reasonable expectations, Crisis Zone escalated right alongside in real time with daily posts on Instagram. Crisis Zone's battle mission was to amuse the masses. No matter how horrible and bleak everything seemed, at least Werewolf Jones wasn't in your house. Over the course of 2020, Crisis Zone has amassed unprecedented amounts of new fans to the Meg and Mog universe and is presented here unabridged and uncensored with a slew of added pages and scenes deleted from the webcomic, as well as an extensive director's commentary from Hanselman himself. Watch Meg attempt to bury herself in a digital world of escapism. See Mog fall down the rabbit hole of paranoia and conspiracy theories. Experience Al's metamorphosis from timid and uptight worrywart to a nose holes barred ass kicking leader and back again. Witness Werewolf Jones's journey from reluctant erotic performer to viral TikTok stardom to Netflix sensation. 
Bouncing rapidly between comedy, horror, action, and relational soap operatics, Crisis Zone refuses to take the pedal off the gas as we all hurtle towards unknown destination. Next up is Altered Carbon, One Life, One Death. Also August 17th, this one's from, and from Dynamite. From the world of the best-selling trilogy of books and the hit Netflix show comes a new chapter in the Altered Carbon universe. In the future, bodies can be changed like clothing giving life an entirely new meaning or lack of meaning. Takeshi Kovacs, once a member of the Envoy Corps, the elite deadly troops of the Interstellar Earth Protectorate, now finds himself imprisoned, both in a jail and in an extremely weak body. When he learns that envoys he served with in a battle he somehow can't remember have been stolen and sold to one of the richest people in the universe, Kovacs vows to rescue them and get revenge. Leaving behind a staggering body count as he blazes across the galaxy, he wonders why he has a hole in his memory and what secrets that gap holds for understanding his future and himself. Altered Carbon writer Richard K. Morgan is joined by writer Scott Brian Wilson and artist Matt, Matt Fuchs to deliver the original graphic novel Altered Carbon One Life, One Death, a violent galaxy-spanning adventure of prison breaks, political intrigue, and sinister machinations. And from Horror Master Genji Itu, we get Censor on the 17th from Viz Media, which explores a new frontier with a grand cosmic horror tale in which a mysterious woman has her way with the world. A woman walks alone at the foot of Mount Sengoku. A man appears, saying he's been waiting for her, and invites her to a nearby village. Surprisingly, the village is covered in hair-like volcanic glass fibers, and all of it shines a bright gold. At night, when the villagers perform their custom of gazing up at the starry sky, countless unidentified flying objects come raining down on them. This is the opening act for the terror about to occur. Another August 17th, this from PM Press, is a fictionalized retelling of a KKK riot that occurred in Carnegie, PA in 1923 and the resistance to it. The Ku Klux Klan is at the height of its power in the U.S. as membership swells into the millions and they expand beyond their original southern borders. As they grow, so do their targets. As they continue their campaign of terror against African Americans, the list, their list now includes Catholics and Jews, Southern and Eastern Europeans, all in the name of white supremacy. But they are no longer considered a terrorist organization. By adding the message of moral decency, family values, and temperance, the Klan has sopped on a thin veneer of respectability and has become a civic organization, attracting ordinary citizens, law enforcement, and politicians to their particular brand of white Anglo-Saxon and Protestant Americanism. Pennsylvania enthusiastically joined that wave. That was when the Grand Dragon of Pennsylvania decided to display the Klan's newfound power in a show of force. He chose a small town outside of Pittsburgh named after Andrew Carnegie, a small, unassuming borough full of Catholics and Jews, the perfect place to teach these immigrants a lesson. Some 30,000 members of the Klan gathered from as far as Kentucky for Carnegie Day. After initiating new members, they armed themselves with torches and guns and to descend upon the town to show them exactly what Americanism was all about. The Day the Klan Came to Town is a fictionalized retelling of the riot focusing on a Sicilian immigrant, Primo Salerno. He's not a leader. He's a man with a troubled past. He was pulled from the sulfur mines of Sicily as a teen to fight in the First World War. Afterward, he became the focus of a local fascist and was forced to emigrate to the United States. He doesn't want to fight, but feels that he may have no choice. The entire town needs him, and indeed everybody, to make a stand. And to squeeze in a few more titles to close out uh, with another from the 17th, James Bond, Big Things from Dynamite Entertainment. When a priceless piece of art is found to be fake, investigations lead down a rabbit hole of international crime and corruption. But what the hell does James Bond know about the world of art forgery? Agent 007 is a loner by nature, but finally he accepts that he needs help. But will trusting someone else help his mission or lead to the death of innocence? And Radiant Black Volume 1 at August 24th is an image book, is the most acclaimed new series of 2021. Visionary writer Kyle Higgins and artist Marcelo Costa reinvent superheroes for a new generation. Nathan Burnett has just turned 30 and things aren't great. He's working and failing at two jobs. His credit card debt is piling up and his only move is moving back home with his parents. But when Nathan discovers the ethereal cosmic radiant 
he's given the power to radically change his fortunes unless the comic beings who created them succeed in taking them back by any means necessary. Oh, and did we mention there's a Red Radiant who wants Nathan dead? This is the next must-read comic book series, and it starts here. And finally, Old Heads on August 31st, also from Image, is Space Jam meets Fright Night in this hilarious action horror as a former basketball star returns home to bury his mother only to learn of her mysterious past his destiny, and to find himself embroiled in a decades-long blood feud with actual Dracula. Just looks great. And a sneak peek at some titles I'll be highlighting in the September book buzz. First, there's Sacred Six, Volume 1, Numerology. Would have been featured in this book buzz, but the date has pushed from August to September, so you'll have to wait to hear about this book next time. In the middle, it's Lady and the Tramp meets Silence of the Lands in Stray Dogs. I'll explain next time. And third, for fans of Stephen Graham Jones, Memorial Ride is coming October 15th. There are so many great graphic novels these days, we can't get them all in, so make sure you put in your request through the library catalog or email, to re email me directly. We'd love to get your requests. My final book is also the book I'm currently reading, The Way of the House Husband, Volume 5, to get ready for Volume 6's release in September. The cover's right up there in the left-hand corner. Thanks so much for listening. <laughs>